All right, 12.05 here on the West Coast, 3.05 on the East. How's everyone doing today? Happy Friday. Good stuff. Thank you for joining me. Um, we're going to be talking about professional communication and business tools today. So uh, definitely, you know, want as much engagement and participation from you all as possible. Um, it's a pretty short slide deck and presentation just because, you know, I definitely want to cater it to what questions may be out there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about emails and email etiquette, introductory emails, things of that nature, and then also some business tools that are out there as well. Um, yeah, would love to get, you know, just uh, how's everybody doing today, you know, what you're looking to get out of the webinar today, any, any comments and kind of to start this whole thing off? Just here to learn. <laughs> That's all I've got. <laughs> awesome. Welcome. I think, um, I, I definitely think in the professional female athlete space, um, there is a desire to have like more confidence around just having professional conversations with brands and companies on your own. Um, and I don't know about you, but I, sometimes I have some anxiety around like, you know, what's the right thing to say? How long should it be? How much information do I give them? Like I have this great idea, but I don't want them to take it and then use it with somebody else. And just so right. kind of like, how do we, how do we reach out? and be, um, you know, give them our 30 second elevator pitch, but I'll uh, have it as a tool to um, give you an opportunity for a more in-depth conversation, maybe over the phone. And so like that initial reach out for me though, I, I do it a lot is still something that drives a lot of anxiety. Um, and so I'm hoping we can kind of talk and work through that. Yeah, absolutely. And please feel free to kind of ask some follow-up questions. Um, you know, I am Cheryl, Cheryl Lala, Director of Training and Career Coaching here uh, at EOS and Parity. And essentially what this deck is going to be kind of modeled after is um, a few sessions that I've done and taken and learned about. And one a book that has been very vital to me has been called The Two-Hour Job Search. And I think that's the book that I reference the most in the slide deck here. And so uh, if you know, you have some more in-depth questions, I would, I would go to that book, but also kind of help you through that. But I think, you know, as we start talking a little bit about introductory and cold emails is what I hear you kind of saying, Lauren, uh, we'll go kind of step by step and see if I can answer some of your questions today as well. Any other questions? Anything else that anybody else wants to get out of this today? Um, Jasmine had something in the chat. Oh, yeah. Agree with Lauren, also how to develop depth in the conversation, yet still professional without it being overly personal or overly cookie cutter. Absolutely. Business-like. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm definitely going to address things like that. So let's get it, go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. All right, wonderful. So hopefully everyone can kind of see my screen at this point. If you do have a question, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask me or um, you can put it in the chat. I just probably won't see the chat while I'm sharing my screen and I will definitely get to them after I stop sharing my screen so we can kind of see each other engage a little bit more. But like I mentioned, today's session is on professional, professional communication and business tools. And so we're going to start with a little bit of an objective. We're going to gain confidence in email etiquette, including those introductory and cold emails, as we were just mentioning. We're going to use your elevator pitch. This is something that I talk about in almost every webinar. Um, I think, you know, when I was a professional athlete myself, I probably had no clue what an elevator pitch was. And then as I was transitioning into, you know, my business career, I started using my elevator pitch a lot more and recognizing what it was. And so this is something that, you know, we did have a webinar on, uh, I think a month ago or so. Definitely want to refresh yourself on the elevator pitch and how you are pitching yourself to anyone, including, you know, business contacts. Um, and then also learn how to connect with others uh, in constant communication, stay in touch. So how do we do that a little bit? So those are the objectives of today. We're going to start off with email etiquette. So in the professional world, like we're going to be talking mostly about just kind of like, you know, what do we do? We receive an email, we get an email. Um, what is it that's kind of a best practice? So in just starting out, what is going to be the most appropriate? What is going to be the best etiquette as we're networking with people we may not know. Uh, in the professional world, it's best to keep emails short, very succinct and to the point. So we don't wanna kind of 
go on and on. We don't want to ramble too much. Uh, you want to check your email regularly. That's the other thing as well. We don't want to forget to check our email. Uh, oftentimes you want to check it more than daily, but if daily is all you can do, daily is great. So go ahead and check your email daily. Uh, respond to urgent emails. So urgent emails or anything that you can see, you know, that has been marked urgent or that sometimes you can have a special notification that it will flag. It'll be like a little red flag. You want to do anything that's urgent within eight hours. Again, it's just a best practice if you can kind of check your email regularly and hopefully get to it within that eight hour mark. Uh, you want to respond to important emails so things, you know, that maybe you've sent out to somebody and you're awaiting their reply. And so, you know, you're cognizant of that email coming in. You want to rep respond to those important emails within 24 hours. Um, and you want to try not to let go any unanswered emails for more than 48 hours or two business days. Of course, you know, if it's the weekend and it's not, you know, your day on, then of course you're going to respond uh, maybe a couple days later, but two business days is just good email etiquette. So you want to stay in the know with your emails, right? You want to make sure to stay as regularly connected to your email as possible. I know that can be difficult as a professional athlete. You're training, you're not glued to your phone, you're not glued to the computer. Um, but if you are, you know, looking to engage with folks, if you're looking to kind of make a transition into the business world, if you're looking for different sponsorship or business opportunities, you have to kind of stay engaged to the, to the best you can. And so these are just best practices as you kind of think about, all right, sending emails, receiving emails, what is something that you have to respond to within that eight hours? What is something that you have to respond to within 24 hours? And, you know, you shouldn't as a best practice, let things go more than two days. If you do, make sure to have a vacation kind of reminder set. It's now super easy to kind of put those things in your setting where you just have, you know, I'm on vacation and then people know that to not respect, to not expect an answer from you in the next few days. So just put your vacation setting on um, if you're going to go more than those two business days away from your computer. And you can do it as regularly as you can just to say, hey, you know, everyone nowadays is working remotely for the most part. And so having a vacation reminder or vacation setting on is totally okay. Okay, so emails, the do's, use a professional email address. So even if this is a personal address, even this is, if this is a Gmail or a Hotmail or whatever it is, that's kind of like a personal email address, try to make sure that your email address is professional as it can be. So maybe your first and last name, middle initial, if you have one. Um, you, we wanna steer clear of, you know, when we, at least I think about it myself a little bit when I was, you know, first creating an email for myself uh, back in high school and college, I used to have like these funny emails and things like that nicknames, all that other stuff, right? We want to steer away from those. We want to keep it as professional as possible. You can still have your fun emails, right? Email addresses if you want, but maybe those aren't the ones that you're going to be using in a professional setting. You're going to be using the ones that have encompass more of you, the, the first and last name, middle initial, a couple numbers on there, whatever it is to kind of differentiate yourself, but just try to keep it as professional as possible. Um, include a clear and direct subject line. So this is something that I can't emphasize enough. Oftentimes what happens is we're so thinking about the body of the email and the content of the email that we forget about the subject line, right? And so oftentimes you'll get these emails where there is no subject line and there's nothing there or it's not really clear what you're asking. Um, so try to include a direct and clear subject line. And the best practice around this one is sometimes to write the content first, as backwards as that kind of sounds, is just write the content, get your thoughts out onto the email uh, and see kind of the direction it's running and then write the subject in later so that you know exactly what it is unless you have a clear and organized thought as to what that email is going to be and then you can include the subject line first and then write the body of the content uh, of contents later but essentially just don't forget to put a subject line in it's very important so that people can kind of filter as they go through their email inbox can kind of filter and find the message uh, later on because a lot of people get a lot of emails all the time right I'm sure you all get emails all the time every day and you want to be able to filter them and the best and clearest way to filter them is when people put in a subject line include a signature line at the end of your email so if you don't do that already please do it now uh, again go into your settings and just you know put a signature line in so just first and last name uh, your uh, you know professional athlete Olympian uh, your sport you could do anything like that uh, degrees anything like that so even if it is your personal email address and not quote unquote a work email address go ahead and put your signature line in so that people get a sense of kind of who you are it's just a professional thing to do when it comes to your email uh, 
uh, start the email professionally. So as you get into kind of writing this professional email, you don't want to start with a hey or a how you doing or anything like that. You want to just keep it as professional as possible. So start with the hi or hello or dear. Keep it, you know, as professional as possible. Even if you somewhat know the person, just keep that first email, that introductory email. Even if, you know, you know the person, you're an acquaintance to them, um, you've met them previously, and maybe this is your first email with them, just try to keep that first beginning salutation as professional as possible. So the hi, hello, or dear. And proofread the email. I can't say this enough. There's spell check on the, uh, you know, email addresses now. So it's just really easy to go ahead and spell check and proofread and do the grammar and all that stuff. Do that a couple of times and just make sure that you're, you're checking as often as possible. I also say this when it comes to like resumes or cover letters or anything like that. Anytime you're kind of putting your name behind any piece of documentation, you want to spell check it and grammar check it as well. Uh, just so that, you know, you're making sense and everything's kind of flowing quickly. Because oftentimes I know I do this where I'm writing emails quickly and the grammar sometimes doesn't make sense. And so I love having that little grammar setting to kind of hit on. And then ensure the recipient is the intended recipient. So <laughs> that's quite a mistake as well. Sometimes again, we're busy and we forget to email the right person. It's kind of like texting the wrong person, right? Embarrassing happens sometimes. Um, you know, it happens. Just try to check it as much as possible. So make sure that the recipient is the intended recipient. And what I actually actually like to do is it also sometimes you know you hit send prematurely those things can also happen as well is go ahead and just put the intended recipient at the end so that's probably the last thing you will do you'll write your content of your email you'll put in your subject line and then you'll put the recipient at the very very end so that gives you some time to kind of proofread play around with the email and if you accidentally hit send or whatever it won't go anywhere right because there's no intended recipient there so you put that in last is just like a best practice any questions about just kind of those, you know, etiquette reminders, best practices so far? Um, a question on uh, subject lines. Like, I, I feel like most often I'm writing emails that are like asking for money or something that most people are really quick to just put spam or delete or like don't want to deal with this. So like, <laughs> how do you make a correct and clear subject line that's also not something someone just trashes? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So you want to play around with it. It's just kind of like your analytics that you're doing in any kind of social media post, like what's going to be the most engaging, right? And so there's going to be a little bit of, of, of brainstorming and working and seeing kind of what is going to be the most direct and best way to get people's attention. And you can, you know, also set up your email where you can get read receipts and see how often people are actually opening them. But in terms of asking for money, right, asking for sponsorships, I would just put it in there, honestly, you know, it's, it's an ask for money. Um, um, if that person opens the email that you know, right, they're interested, you know that they're interested. If they don't, well, they're going to spam it anyway, right? They, if they're not interested in sponsoring you, if they're not interested in giving you money, even if they read the email, they may still not be interested. So uh, putting in, you know, sponsorship needed, um, sponsorship available, something where you're marketing yourself as a professional female athlete and you are elite, you are, you know, something that people and companies want. This is a, this is a marketing tactic, right? So um, putting in to that subject line sponsorship opportunity for you you know, or sponsorship available, anything like that, that gets the message across that they would be happy to kind of have you too, right? So you don't want to be like, oh, you'd be happy to have me, but you also don't want to be self-defeating to the point where you think that they wouldn't sponsor you because a lot of times companies are looking for professional female athletes to, to sponsor and to work with. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. That's, that's actually something I've tried to play with as well. And I think the, the word sponsorship, I think, sometimes carries with it, like, a long contract and relationship. And so I've just kind of played a little bit with, like, verbiage. So maybe instead of saying partnership, I mean, sponsorship, I'll say, like, collaboration idea or partnership opportunity. Because a collaboration or par partnership can be, like, a one-off that kind of gets you in the door to see if, you know, this is something that they want to bring you on full time or uh, they can piecemeal it out. And so I think um, one thing is, is like the verbiage of it. So maybe try collaboration or partnership, but then also in the email, I think it's important to kind of lay out a bit of your plan because um, a lot of brands are scrambling right now, like how to execute and how to market. And it, it helps them a lot if you already kind of have what your value adds are. Um, as a thing, like my big thing is 
blogs, writing blogs for me is really easy. And like brands are always looking for content that they can push out. And, you know, being a pro female athlete is something that looks good to brands for, to work with, no matter what the brand is, because supporting women and supporting female athletics is a big thing right now. So that's, those are my two thoughts or eight thoughts. I don't know how many thoughts. But. <laughs> All thoughts welcome. All thoughts are welcome. So yeah, putting down, you know, collaboration opportunity, partnership opportunity, uh, blog opportunity, it sounds like, vlog opportunity, any of those things I think work well at the signature line. And it gets across what the content is going to be and also provides a clear and direct subject line. Thank you for those thoughts there, Lauren. Any other questions? All right, move it along. The don'ts. The don'ts, right? So don't ramble uh, or be too conversational. Again, this is going to be like a professional introductory email. And so you don't want to get, you know, um, too funny. It's hard to really tell what tone is on email. So one person can kind of interpret it one way. Another person can interpret it things a different way. It's kind of like text again and go back to like text, right? You just don't know what the tone is going to be sometimes. And so you don't, especially if somebody doesn't know you, uh, you don't want to ramble too much. You don't want to be too too conversational. You don't want to use too much humor or caps or emojis or exclamation points. You want to just kind of keep this as simple as possible in terms of an introductory email. Um, don't assume confidentiality. So don't put anything in an email, right, that you don't want other people to know. So um, it's just, you know, emails and text, all of that is kind of used as documentation. They can be used later, um, you know, and so you just basically want to be cognizant of the fact that whatever you put on email is not necessarily going to be something that's confidential moving forward. It could be, but it could not be as well. So it could, especially as a professional athlete, you don't want to put anything out there that you don't really want out there. So anytime you write an email, just kind of think about, hey, maybe I should put that in there. Or maybe I can leave that out. Maybe I can leave that for a phone conversation or something like that. Um, and then again, just watch the tone of your email, read and reread it. So make sure it's not coming across, you know, uh, too, too mean, too angry, too judgy, too any of those other things, just coming across very clear and to the point. Um, it's not too rambled on. It's not too conversational. It's not too long. All of those things just kind of want to watch the overall tone of your email. Okay, so introductory email. So how do we write a good one? Um, first and foremost, have a background on the person that you're emailing. So again, this could be somebody that you met kind of traveling, competing, training, whatever it is, you exchange business cards or you look them up on LinkedIn. You have some sort of background on the person you're emailing. Now, if it's not somebody that you came across with, not somebody who's sort of a, an acquaintance, do some research on them. So why is it that you're emailing them? Are they ahead of the company that you need you know, a sponsorship or a partnership opportunity with? Um, what what is it that is kind of making you interested in emailing that person? So you can look them up on LinkedIn, you can look them up on the community uh, website or the community profile um, or the company profile. You can do just kind of, you know, some basic research, to kind of see if you have anything connected to them. So that's the great thing about LinkedIn is you're able to kind of see a lot of that person's background. You're able maybe to see if they went to a similar school to you, if they're from the same area, if they're alum of the same school. Um, maybe they've played a sport. Maybe they've played, you know, your same sport. So anything that kind of links you back to them is kind of cool because that could be kind of the starting point of like that first sentence of your email is that linking point. How do you know them? Um, how should, why should they connect kind of with you, right? Um, so if there's anything there that kind of links them to you or you to them, it's important to kind of piece that out and put that into your introductory email. So it's a little more kind of eye catching. Um, you know, let's see. Uh, yeah, we get gracious and state kind of why you're emailing them. Uh, we're going to put that into our introductory email as well. So you're going to thank them for their time. You're going to understand that people are busy and that it may take them some time, even though, you know, the best practice is to kind of get to folks within two days. For people, you know, who are CEOs or CFOs or COOs, they may get a lot of emails. So it may take them like a week to kind of get back to you. But that week is quite a return for you if they did get back to you. So make sure that you understand that people are busy and you kind of write that into the tone of your introductory email so that they know, you know, you're not expecting a response maybe within the next day, but you'd like one sometime soon. That's kind of a nice thing to write in there as well. So what's an example? So here's an example of just an introductory kind of email kind of set within the parameters of what I was talking about. So, um, you know, dear Jane, just dear whoever it is, my name is X and I'm a professional, you know, athlete. Um, I noticed on your LinkedIn profile that we both attended XYZ 
XYZ University. I'm interested in the work you do at ABC Company and wondering if we could talk for 20 minutes. So essentially what the tone of the first introductory email is, and again, I'm referencing um, some classes and some mentorship that I did with the two hour job search. So I know it's very job focused, but I think it works well for any kind of opportunity when it comes to like sponsorship and partnerships is the tone of your introductory email should be to try to get that person in a phone conversation or a video conference. Those are the things you kind of want to get from an introductory email. Now you could continue to kind of email thread, go back and back and forth, but honestly for better engagement and for them to know exactly who you are, you want this introductory email to set the stage for you and them to talk, right? To talk whether video conference or in person or over the phone, you wanna set it up so that there is a situation where they're gonna conduct maybe a meeting with you, a 20 minute call with you, a 20 minute phone conversation. That's oftentimes you know, a, enough and can cover so many different emails and so many different thoughts without having to go back and forth over a thread. So the whole point of an introductory email is to really get in their ear. Right. So that's why I'm saying there I'm interested in the work you do or I'm interested in some sort of you know, partnership or, or sponsorship opportunity, a collaboration. And I'm wondering if we can talk for 20 minutes. Can we do a, set up a video call? Can we do a phone call? I'm trying to learn more about the profession or you could say I'm trying to to uncover, you know, if we could collaborate on a different project or some projects that I'm thinking about. Um, please let me know if there's a time to connect. So what you're really trying to state out of this in introductory email is a time for them to connect with you. That's can't emphasize that enough is that you're really trying to set the tone of this email so that you can get them in a video conference or on the phone. So in terms of understanding how people are busy, I realize this last sentence there, I realize this may be a busy week for you. So I would love to reach out next week if that's more convenient. So essentially if they um, respond immediately, respond within the week, respond, you know, within a couple of days, wonderful, then you don't have to reach out. But what you're telling them is you're going to reach out again. So that's a key to take away here is that there you're not just going to send this email and that's it kind of wash your hands of it never going to contact them again. No, you're going to actually talk to them next week you're going to re email them on the same thread and just say hey I know last week was busy. I uh, just wanted to follow up and see if we could talk, you know, maybe next week again and set it up again for another 20 minute conversation. So you want to do a couple follow ups to introductory emails. Uh, if you don't get a response the first time, you know, people are busy, like I say, and don't take it too personally just say you're going to follow up with them next week. You can do two to three follow-ups just to make sure that you're, you know, bumping things back up to the top of their inbox. Oftentimes people do want to respond and they get so busy with all the things that are happening in the world right now that they forget to respond. And so bumping it back up to their inbox is totally fine. It's a good practice to do. And you can reach out a couple of times just to see if they're interested. And of course, if they're not after three times, then you could probably let that contact go. Any questions about kind of like this introductory piece? I know I've covered a lot here. I was just gonna say, I think the part that can be most uncomfortable is like knowing when to reach back out. Um, but I think the important thing to remember about a business is that like a, a business thrives essentially on sales, right? And in order to mm -hmm. sell, sometimes you have to, to ask for the order many times. And so as long as you are, um, you're professional and you're, you know, you're stating your intentions, I think it's perfectly fine to continually reach back out. And I also think it's a good opportunity to try different things, you know, to see what gets your final response from them. And I think sometimes we can take a no as like a negative thing, but honestly, I'd rather get just like a no and this is why now. Um, and usually it'll come with a, but like, let's stay in touch type of thing. Cause no one just like wants to say flat out no to an athlete. Cause it's like super rude, um, <laughs> right. but I I'd rather get the no and no, then, then I can, I can, instead of like holding out hope for that one opportunity, I can put my focus towards, uh, somebody else. And then maybe in six months, reach out to that company again, or where I've had it is they end up reaching out to me and being like, mm, no, I'm going to charge you double. <laughs> That's always a wonderful tactic there, right? <laughs> Lauren, does this answer your question though? Because I know you had a specific question about how long it should be. Um, does this answer your question? Does this seem too simple in terms of an introductory approach? No, I think what exactly what you said is correct. Um, the goal is always to get someone on the phone. And I think that's the big thing. It's like, 
you know, state your intentions very quick, quick, quickly and clearly. Um, obviously, I think the connecting with them on either like to let them know you've done some research on them or their company is always, always legitimizes it. And I think it, it helps whoever it is you're emailing know that they're not going to, because like the fear of get, hopping on a call with somebody is to hop on a call for, for, the, for the company, is to hop on a call that you're stuck in where like someone is rambling on and on and just like everything they have to say just doesn't align with anything that you would ever do. And yeah. so I think the, the little bit of a re research that you can do in advance and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be about them, but it could be a, about an initiative that you know their company is currently working through, um, I think is really helpful. So that's like hitting those points, but keeping it clear and concise. Because I think early on, I was writing novels about who I was <laughs> as an athlete and my education and my journey. And I was like, this is who Lauren gives us. And like, that's the part that needs to happen either on a Zoom call or on a telephone call. Like that's where they kind of, for lack of a better term, fall in love with who you are as a person, not in an yeah. initial reach out. So yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's a great point is you want to keep it kind of short uh, and not ramble on too much, right? And you can do that, of course, when you get on the call. And then the other good thing for both you and them is if you set the time allotment, right? If you say 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 15 minutes, you know, if it's less time, 10 minutes is all you have. Even if you set that time allotment and then you send them, you know, the calendar invite or the time to connect or whatever it is for just those amount of minutes, then you both know that, okay, well, 10 minutes is up, 20 minutes is up, I'm going to go now, right? So setting that time so that it's not going to be this call that you're set in for the next, you know, two hours. I, I do have a question, Cheryl. Yeah. Um, can you just say, um, I'm replying to bump this up? Like, is that appropriate to say, just to send an email? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is absolutely appropriate because oftentimes people just forget, right? So if, especially if it's going to be the second time around uh, where you've emailed them this once and then the second time you're like, hey, just following up or hi, sorry, I shouldn't say hey, hi, <laughs> just following up on this email, wanted to bump it to the top of your inbox. Absolutely. Keep it short. Keep it to like two sentences um, because you've already kind of told them the content of the email in that first email. So they want to go back and reread that first email. But Michelle, I think it's totally appropriate to just kind of bump it back up and just say that you're bumping it back up to the top of their inbox. Okay. Thank you. How does that feel though? How does that feel kind of when we talk about doing something like this? Um, it's weird. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but I have to get better at doing it. Um, I'm not good at that, um, especially um, how I write and how I communicate, especially via email, text. I'm very direct and to the point. I'm, I'm like a bullet point person. <laughs> so, so it's hard for me to kind of make it sound nice and add the little flair to it sometimes. And I just get stuck. So it's just an an area I have to really work on and improve in. Yeah. Something yeah, I, I say. Yeah. Go ahead. Something I say when I'm following up is just say, hey, I literally just say, just following up to make sure you got my last email. And just yeah. leave it at that. So like if, like, cause like you could say, I'm just like emailing you again to bump this back up. But if you want to finesse a little bit, just say, hi, Lauren, reaching out again. Just wanted to make sure you got my last email. And looking forward to connecting with you. Yeah. 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 I agree with Lauren. I think um, sometimes the finesse, well, I tend to over finesse and over explain. And I think that just comes from the old school mentality of like writing and emails is way more professional and lengthy versus social media, which is more clickbait. But mm -hmm. realistically, people's inboxes are so full now that I think emails like this that are short, like, hey, can we talk for 20 minutes is almost equivalent to your IG story where you want someone to swipe up into an article and read more or swipe up and click more to learn more. So you're just trying to give them like this snippet. And if they don't respond, you're just saying, hey, I just want to make sure you got it as a reminder, you know, looking forward to reaching out to you. So I kind of look at these introductory emails now where I've changed my perspective where it's clickbait. 
that's how I use it just because I work in the social media world. So I want someone to read something enough where they're like, oh, okay, I need to know more and get to the next step so that I can regurgitate my lengthy story, as Lauren said. I think because we, we're just so taught, especially as women of like – um, in sports, like get their attention, your resume needs to be packed. So you're trying to get all that information to figure out what this person or this company might find interesting. So you, you tend to over regurgitate and no one has time to read, you know, a full page email, but to do 20 minutes on a call and engage with you and have that personal connection is, um, that's all you're trying to get to, to have that opportunity. That's a wonderful point. And that's exactly what I kind of think about. I never thought about it in the terms of clickbait, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> that's exactly what these are, you know, and um, this is weird, right? So this is something that is like uncomfortable and weird and we haven't necessarily been taught this. Um, but now with the social media world and how, you know, we want people to just kind of swipe in and swipe up and to see our stories a little bit more. This is kind of the same thing. You're absolutely right. This tailors right back to emails. Right. Um, and so it is something that you will get more comfortable with. Right, Michelle, especially for you, it's something that, you know, is a practice. We're not born knowing how to do any of these things. And so it is something that as you get to do them more often um, and as you follow up more often you'll get more comfortable with it just like everything you know we do so thank you for all the insight yeah. there anyone else um, about just kind of what, what this feels like right i know it can be weird right so any anyone else want to share just like what makes them uncomfortable about this or does this feel okay now moving forward I think what yes. Lauren said about figuring out how you can help them have that planned out beforehand is so vital because for me, if I just am going to cold email someone, <laughs> it's kind of like, I, I don't know, what do they want from me, you know, or what do yeah. I want from them? So to have that plan ready to go is kind of where that and uh, the whole maintaining your email box and being quick to return, those are things I need to work on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just because I think with being an athlete, like right now in the summertime, it's easy to do. But once we're in competition, like for then I definitely, I kind of get tunnel vision during the season and trying to manage those best practices during that time. It usually just goes out the window. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the tough thing, right? Is when you're competing and training, it's so much harder to keep in regular contact with emails. Like you're not glued to your computer, you're not glued to your phone. And so perhaps, you know, in those situations, if there's somebody who's supporting you on your team, a partner, family member, whatever it is that can kind of monitor the email that you trust, um, just to kind of look at like junk and then ones that you should absolutely respond back to in the next, you know, 24 hours or 48 hours, maybe that would be a good strategy kind of moving forward. So you don't necessarily have to look at it you have somebody else look at it and kind of filter the ones that need a response from you immediately how does that sound yeah you're not the first person to recommend that to me and i really <laughs> should take that advice because um i mean it just happens every year at this point right <laughs> you get into the season and then just goals become more important <laughs> right but to have someone else would be a good plan yeah, yeah. Emily Alana does that at the Olympics. Um, is she has like someone in her family just completely run her social media as well. That's smart. Yeah. Yeah. And the point is that you don't want to miss anything, right? You don't want to miss an opportunity. You don't want to miss something that would be like, oh, if I would have responded to that just a day ago, um, I could have had that or something like that. If there, if there was something, oftentimes, you know, you're not going to come across that, but there could be these rare instances where you would really want to be a part of this collaboration or partnership and you missed it just because you were a day late or a week late or whatever it is, right? Uh, and so having somebody else filter your inbox for you and maybe not even read, maybe you don't, you're not even comfortable with them reading the message. Messages. Maybe it's just like, hey, can you filter all the spam <laughs> and keep any subject line, right? Again, why the subject line is so important. Keep any subject line that you think is interesting. I think that could be a great use for the vacation email, right? It's uh, the vacation away message. It's like the I'm competing and like I'm really excited that you've reached out to me. Just know that like right now my main focus is this, that, but that doesn't mean I don't want to have the conversation. I word it differently, but you know what I'm saying. 
Yeah, I had that same thought when you were talking about that. Yeah, absolutely. And Emily, a good recommendation too is I use the flags with an email. So I kind of, since I check my email daily or multiple times a day, I don't have always the time in that moment when I'm checking to read through, but I'll flag something that I know I need to go back to. Or if you have someone monitoring it during the season or high competition time, you can quickly flag and then they know these are priorities that they need to at least give a response or an away message for you or say, hey, Emily is away competing at this time, but she's available next week, blah, 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 blah. We will follow up then. But then you have those flagged as in these are your priority to stay on top of. And then you're also informed rather than needing to have a recap from someone else to tell you about your emails. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Awesome. Some, some great advice here. Um, all right, so uh, we kind of talked a little bit about this as we were we were talking through that last slide, but essentially following up an email, use your elevator pitch. Um, the elevator pitch is just, you know, 20 to 40 seconds to introduce yourself. It's just named after if you were stuck in the elevator with somebody and you wanted to get across who you were. I'm sure all of you have a pretty good elevator pitch, but you would definitely want to name who you are, what it is you're looking for, and what it is the ask that you need. And so this would be something that you would do again off of a video conference or a call um, if they're not the right person. So you've done this introductory email, you've gotten them on the phone, right? You've gotten them into a vid video conference. And then in those first 10 minutes, you realize, you know what, this is not the person. Uh, ask, ask if there's another person that they, you know, anybody that they know in their network, it's all about kind of creating a good network. And so ask if there's somebody else, you know, maybe you're looking into something specific in terms of marketing or a partnership and they do, you know, the complete opposite. They're like accounting or something along those lines. Um, ask them if there's somebody in their network who better suits or not better suits, but who can help them with the specific task that you need help with, whether it's the marketing or sponsorship or collaboration opportunity, ask that person on the call if there is someone in their network network, somebody they work with, somebody they know of that can help them in that specific, can help you in that specific task. And so always ask, um, you know, those follow-up questions to see if there's somebody else that they can connect you with as well. And even if they're not the right person, still build rapport. You never know, right? Accountants are actually really important people to us. And so you never know where you're going to need them. You're probably going to need them around tax season, of course. Um, but just stay courteous, stay positive, um, make sure that you build rapport because you never know when you're going to actually need somebody that you didn't think you, need, you, need, you needed in the first place and then you kind of need them after the fact. Um, and then if it is the person, if it is the person and you, you know, have given your elevator speech and they are now um, talking and they are now kind of thinking about all the ways in which they can help you, let them lead that conversation. So let them lead, because they are going to know their company the best. They're going to know what it is that they kind of need and where they can kind of see you fitting in after you've given your elevator speech. So let them lead the conversation from that point. So the first part is going to be, you know, you leading the conversation as the professional female athlete and asking them for what it is you need and giving that elevator speech. And then that second part of the conversation is waiting for them. Ask them to lead that conversation. Um, and to see where it goes in terms of, you know, you can probe for a little more questions, but I think once they hear your elevator speech, they're going to be able to connect the dots for you a little bit and to understand where it is they can help you, whether it's in their company or personally or whatever it is, um, collaboration wise. Uh, any questions about emails? Now we're going to move on to business tools, but any questions about anything that I just said there? Okay, awesome. All right. And so business tools. So these are just business tools that again, want you to be aware of. You've probably heard of most of them already. Um, when you're competing and training, it's not like, again, you're going to be on the computer too much. And so, you know, the business world is continuing with all these apps and software developments and all these other stuff. And so these are just business tools that I want you to be mindful of. You do not need to be experts in any of them by any means, but this is kind of now because emails are, are you know, kind of transitioning a lot of people are moving away from emails and not really conducting a lot of business on emails. They're moving it to these apps and business tools that kind of eliminate emails. And so the whole point to these next business tools are basically, you know, apps uh, that help to alleviate the amount of emails that are coming in. So no, you can't really do like an introductory email or a cold email to this, but you can continue to facilitate a conversation on some of these business tools um, that I'm going to kind of show you. So the first one is Slack. So I'm uh, 
I'm expecting that most of you may be familiar with Slack. Uh, Slack just gives you access to real-time conversations with any teammate or team. So this is where a lot of businesses are now using Slack as opposed to email. And so they'll create different channels is what it's called. And so you'll get a membership to Slack. It's free. Um, you get in there, there's going to be a channel you're going to be on. And then other teammates might be on different channels, right? So all of the channels can be a different type of category and content. And you can subscribe to one channel or the other channel or all the channels if you really wanted to. And then when somebody comments in that channel, it's specifically related to the, um, the content that is kind of the headline of the channel. So what this does is just alleviates email a little bit, right? And so there can be a variety of different channels that you're using to kind of keep in constant communication. The other good way to kind of use Slack is that you don't have to get, give your phone number out. You, instead of texting, right, you can kind of Slack things to people. Um, I'm assuming most people have kind of heard of Slack at this point. Is there, is there anyone that has not heard of Slack or have, has any questions about like Slack and, and if they should kind of sign up for some of the channels that maybe have already come their way? Any personal experience with Slack? Anybody really like Slack or not? Uh, I'm just not a fan of another thing I have to check. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. I forget about Slack. They're like, oh, yeah, because we're USATL for the athletes yeah. to communicate. They use Slack. Right. And I'm like, that's one more thing I have to check. I already can't keep up with emails and text messages. And now I got to go log <laughs> into an app. So that's my only thing. I don't like it. <laughs> I mean, I, I like it. Like, it's cool. But to re check regularly, I don't like that part. Yeah. I was with Michelle as well, um, <laughs> originally, because like we use Slack with parody. But I think once you get past that initial, like going back and forth with somebody about like a speaking engagement or something, it would have been really nice to just like, if I had a quick question to Slack them. So I definitely think there's a time and place for it. Um, and to your point, Cheryl, it's like, it's not going to be in the initial reach out. But I think if you do get to a point where, with a company where you're almost like an, on a consulting type um, relationship, then the business tools that you're talking about could be really helpful. But I agree with you, Michelle. I was like, I want to download another app and get on another thing, <laughs> check another thing. <laughs> Yeah, and I agree with both of you. You know, I was resistant to Slack when I first kind of started on it, but now I find it to be really helpful and really useful for all the reasons you mentioned, Lauren. You know, it's just easier to kind of get on there instead of try to email somebody again or try to think about a formal subject line or all these other things, right? You can just get in there and just Slack them real quick. Um, so it is now an easier tool to use. It, again, I think comes with practice. It is something that most businesses and companies are moving towards in terms of forums, right? Because then everybody can be on on that channel and kind of see. Um, you can personally Slack people as well. So it can be a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but for the most part, it's a team conversation. So you can see, you know, many people on a team and what they're saying. So as Michelle was saying with the whole USATF, you can see, you know, everybody's responding to that Slack channel. Um, but you can also privately message them as well. But it is one of those things, it's a growing pain, right? As we transition into the business world, this is one of the tools that is there now, it's heavily used. And so like anything, we're just gonna kind of prepare and practice and get used to it. And, and it does, it does totally get better <laughs> with Slack. <laughs> All right, next business tool is Asana. So this is one of those that um, some companies use, some companies don't, but essentially uh, it's free as well. You can actually create your own Asana uh, uh, platform as well. And so basically this will keep you on task. So if you're one of those people who likes checklists and to-do lists and to like check off different things and, and uh, to make sure that somebody knows that you've done what you said you're gonna do, you can actually put it on Asana. So it's basically a project management tool. And so let's say, you know, marketing campaign, this is just an example. I pulled from the internet, but essentially like if there is a campaign that you're working on with multiple people, you can give them subcategories or like process goals that you need in order to achieve the larger goal at hand. And you can see their progress towards it as well. So if you're all working on a marketing campaign and one person's working on Instagram, the other person's working on Facebook, the other person's working on LinkedIn, you can kind of see their progress as they go. And as they complete tasks, they just basically check them off. A lot of gratification with this tool, because when you actually do check off a project, 
project as completed. It feels really great. There's this unicorn that goes flying and it's wonderful. Um, but if you like lists, if you like to do lists, uh, this is kind of the tool for you. These, this is another tool that businesses will use quite a bit in terms of just, you know, making sure you're staying up on your projects. Um, but yeah, it has calendars in it. It has due dates in it. You can assign basically um, other people that you need help with uh, to, you can assign them a task in it as well. Anybody used Asana or has any anything to say about Asana? Minji just educated me on it today, so no. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a cool one if you like kind of clicking tasks, right? And I, I'm that person. I like to see the unicorn go flying. So I'm, I'm a fan of Asana. All right, next slide here. If I can get my computer, unfortunately. My computer is frozen. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think my computer just froze on me. Uh, I'm going to stop the share real quick and then start the share again. Apologies, technology. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Okay. Next one is video conference. I probably don't need to say too much about video conferencing since we're already on one here. Uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts Meet, Skype, Cisco WebEx meetings, GoToMeeting, all the different ways we can kind of video conference. Um, next one that I wanted to talk about is Calendly. I'm not sure if I'm saying that all too correctly. I just read it quite a bit, but it's basically an automatic automated scheduling software. So if you don't have it already, it's something that's great because it will sync up your calendar. And then, you know, one of the emails that I always um, just struggle with responding to is basically those ones that are like, give me your best times, give me your availability, give me, you know, the best times that work for you. Calendly will do that for you. And so it'll look on your calendar and you can sync up to six calendars of yours on there and basically check the availability of you and help check the availability of other people. Google also do, does this as well. If you have if you have a shared Google Calendar within an organization, but this does this with outside, like an external organization, so external folks. Um, but something to kind of look into. It's also a free app, and it's a great way to kind of schedule yourself. Anybody use this tool? Um, yeah. I've been thinking about actually using it because um, a friend of mine uses it. And as time goes on, I'm trying to, I'm a paper pen type of girl. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, having this kind of seem like it might help, especially if it already kind of uh, puts it out there and you can kind of already, what if you just said that part? <laughs> if it kind of already put together my times, like that would help. Because sometimes looking at my calendar, I'm like, well, I'm not even sure what time I would even pick. So sometimes that's hard for me, so. Yes, I'm, really I'm, I'm with you. I am with you, Michelle. I'm exactly like you. I, I look at my calendar. I'm like, I don't know. This is confusing me sometimes. So this is a great tool to use because it just automatically populates it and it's free. So uh, one of those to use just to make your life a little easier. Okay, and then uh, Microsoft Office and G Suite. So obviously this is one of those things that we always put on our resumes, right? Like, oh, we're proficient in Microsoft Office and G Suite. And I think for the most part, everyone really is. But what that entails, Microsoft Office, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, um, OneNote, I don't use all that much, but it's basically like your notebook, publisher, uh, and access. So, you know, the ones that you're probably really going to focus on are the Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook is just like the mail version of uh, Microsoft Office. Uh, and then the same kind of tools are available on G Suite as well. If you prefer G Suite over uh, Microsoft Office, you would get the docs, you would get Gmail, you would get um, the calendar, all of those other things that are on there. So essentially, you know, Microsoft Office and G Suite, these are just terms that are out there. 
as well. Um, the last one is CRM. CRM is something that's uh, you know quite a bit out there as well, and so it can be something that can kind of stump you. You may not have come across it, or you may have, but most of the time in businesses and companies that are larger, they will have some sort of cu customer relationship management, um, and that's what CRM basically just stands for. And essentially, even you as a prospect will be listed in their CRM. Uh, so it's one way for people to kind of keep track of conversations that are happening in a business setting. So if somebody has emailed you, oftentimes what will happen is that there's so many notifications on an email and there's apps that integrate it back to a CRM system. So every time they email you, what will happen is that they'll create a log. Each one of these CRMs are basically like a running log of any time that they've communicated with you, any phone call that they've had with you, it will all integrate back into the CRM system that they're using. Um, and so th this is a great one for also like fundraising people will use this quite a bit to keep track of like donors, um, any kind of like customer outreach, they will use types of CRMs like this to basically, you know, um, keep track of any kind of outreach they're doing, anyone that they're contacting or prospecting over and over again. And so some of the CRM companies that are out there are Salesforce and Insightly, Microsoft Dynamics, Oracle. Um, these are just things to know. This is not something that you need to kind of research, just something to know so that when you come across the acronym CRM, you know exactly what that means. Okay, so I think we've gotten to the top of the hour here. Uh, any questions about any of those business tools? Um, I actually have a question. So if you want to learn how to use um, a Microsoft Office more efficiently, because I say it's been a long time since I really had to make a spreadsheet or something like that, yeah. or is there classes or something that I can look up to take to kind of brush up on how to use these? I just get some basics. There are, there are absolutely. There's quite a platform now. There's quite a few different companies that come to mind actually that will train you on Excel uh, specifically, right? Because Excel is the one that can get super confusing. Um, and it depends on which one you're going to use. So if you're going to use Microsoft Excel, you could probably go to like General Assembly. General Assembly has quite a few different training. You can do like a three hour training or you can do a one hour training and it will just be in all the ways to use Excel and, and use a spreadsheet. If you want to use Google spreadsheets, they also have their own training and platform and I believe that one is free I can send it to you Michelle because I'm not sure it's, it's I'm blanking on it off the top of my head but they have a um, they have a, a training service essentially where they will go through all the apps not just the spreadsheet app they'll actually go through like even the analytics app for for G okay. Suite so but General Assembly I would start there if you're interested specifically in Excel and Microsoft uh, Office Michelle, you might, I know that um, you might be able to reach out through ACE too, through the USOPC, because they have oh. done a partnership with um, General Assembly in the past on different courses. And, and as an athlete, you got a free free course. So I did one on marketing um, and they, okay. might, uh, they might work something out or know who to connect you to if, if the price is a kind of contentious point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had a question that I guess it goes back to um, email, but um, I recently, well, I'm kind of like more operate local in small town and it's not really like <laughs> we don't use many of these business tools or anything. It's very like word of mouth, handshake sort of thing. Anyway, um, I found myself in a situation where I felt that I had been I guess mistreated is the right word or like the conversations we had in person weren't the same as the conversations that then happened on email. Yeah. And I was unsure about, I mean, I ended up feel, I felt I was wrong. So I stuck up for myself and it didn't go very well. And so yeah. I guess I'm wondering like how, if you do feel like you've been wronged or something, like how do you professionally stick up for yourself? And like, how do you approach those more like difficult conversations in a way that don't, you know, make people's defenses just go up really high or like, you know, what, how do you navigate those more difficult situations when you do begin a relationship with somebody? Yeah, yeah. And Rosie, I'm so sorry to hear that you um, had this situation. That's a really tough situation to be in. And it's actually, you know, something that happens quite a bit 
quite a bit as well. Um, and I'm not sure that the answer is to say that you're not going to disrupt them in some way or make them defensive because you probably are in any way um, if you have a different understanding than them, right? Because that's kind of like a conflict in itself where you have a different understanding than them. And so if it was a word of mouth conflict, it might also be like an email conflict as well. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but my advice to you would be to always follow up any conversations that you're having with people with email. Even if they're not using any of the business tools, most people will use an email record. So you do want to uh, document whatever the conversation was just within your understanding of it, right? So you could say like, my understanding of this conversation we had yesterday was X, Y, and Z, right? This is my understanding of it. So you're just placing the blame really on yourself. You're not placing the blame on anybody else. You're just saying, this is what I heard. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And so that will give them the opportunity to say, well, no, that's not what I heard, or yes, um, that's accurate, right? Um, it's, it's, again, like I was saying, kind of in the email portion, emails are documentation, and the only way to kind of follow up conversations is to kind of email document it. Now, when you do document an email, you want to make sure that you're not giving any kind of other information. So you don't want to go too deep into like, and these are the reasons why, and this is X. You just want to keep it very factual, very statement oriented. Like, this is what I heard you say, period, the end. Not any other like feelings or thoughts that you have associated with it. Just very, this is what I heard you say. This is my understanding of the conversation. And again, keep it as short and succinct as possible. Does that help you? Yeah, that does. That, that's a very good idea and tactic to take, I think. Hey, as a follow-up question, sorry, I have some background noise, so let me know if it's too distracting. Um, was, the, was the misunderstanding ar around being paid? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so that's what I was thinking. I would say that um, what, what Chanel said is huge, right? Following up with an email is really important, but I think once you have that initial conversation and you're talking about details, um, it can be really awkward to ask for money. And so what I always say is like, Hey, these are like our next steps for me is like, we'll continue to kind of round out what the event's going to look like. And then if you can maybe work with the people on your end and to think about like what your budget is for this. So I always, I always bring up budget as early as, a, as, as appropriate, right? You're not going to bring a budget in your like additional reach out email, but after you've like kind of gone back and forth and had a conversation and when you're starting to talk about the specifics of whatever it is that you're going to be doing, I think it's perfectly acceptable to just be like, Hey, and you know, just let me know if you have some like budgetary restrictions around uh, moving forward with this so that, you know, something like that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Cause it's, it's hard. Cause like, especially I think the, the more informal your relationship could, is with somebody, you know, because I had this woman who wanted me to do a speaking engagement for her office and didn't want to pay me. And she was, she was explaining to me that she has all these top CEOs come in and speak for free. And I just said, point blank, first of all, I did the math and I was like, the chance of becoming a CEO is much higher than the chance of becoming a winter Olympic medalist. One. <laughs> and I'll, just for clear background, like I had had dinner with this woman in person. I had already done her a favor and done like a free speaking engagement for like, uh, you know, like a, a women and girls symposium. So like, you know, you already played your favor card once, ma'am. Yeah. Just stop there. But then yeah. also I just put it back and I said, look, this is definitely something that I would really love to do, but you have to understand the space that I'm in is yeah. my my first priority is as an athlete and so if my time is not spent uh directly on becoming a better athlete it needs to be something that is going to support my ability to fund the ability to become a, a better athlete and sorry yeah. the noise is just getting worse so i'm gonna go on mute <laughs> <laughs> uh, no Hopefully i think you caught that ones. yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of being as proactive as you possibly can. So even as you're having like those informal conversations, if you want to just follow it up with a just like, this is what I heard, so that you're not getting to the point of like a misunderstanding with them later, you can actually just go back to your email and say like, oh, this is what I heard, this was the price, or this was the budget, or this was the blah, blah, blah. If you do that, you know, as early as possible, then you just kind of set the precedence of like, hey, you're always going to follow up these conversations with email so that everyone's on the same page. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. And remember, a big part of parity is like relying on this community that we're building. And so if you run into a situation like this, you know, and you know, somebody else in our community handles it, 
feel free to reach out to them or reach out to us to get their information. Me personally, I'm a big proponent of like just promoting other women and making them feel strong about every time I talk, it comes flies right over. Oh, and so <laughs> my point is, is feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that concludes our webinar. Unless there's any other meetings or many meetings. Well, there's plenty of other meetings, I'm sure. Um, if there's any other questions, uh, you can reach out to Lauren or myself, uh, Cheryl at EOS.coach. Um, I think Lauren, yours is Lauren at EOS.coach as well. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, please let us know. We hope you found this informative, empowering as a female athlete. Please let us know if there's any other topics that you'd like. And um, yeah, have a great, have a great Friday. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. You Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.